Hello, everybody. Every now and then, we like to engage in the timeless art of self-promotion here on the podcast. So if you are interested in supporting what I'm doing here, you can go over to patreon.com slash reflecting history. We have a lot of different perks and extra content, bonus stuff that you can get access to, monthly recommendations for stuff that I think is cool and that I'm into in pop culture, dozens of bonus episodes from the world of history, psychology, and philosophy. Now a couple of different audio courses and podcast series are also available on Patreon, notably my series on Nazi Germany and the development of fascism prior to World War II. I call it Nazi Germany and the Battle for the Human Heart. This is now on Patreon. I have a nine-episode podcast series on the television show Arcane, which was a lot of fun. There's stuff on the Dark Knight trilogy and some incoming podcast series that I'm working on as well. So you can support for as long or as little as you like and get access to all that stuff, which might be cool. And again... All of that stuff is on patreon.com slash reflecting history, and there's a link to all of that in the show notes. You can also support the podcast in other ways. Sometimes the simplest and easiest way to support is just continue listening to the podcast, which I'm very grateful for. You can tell a friend or family member about the podcast. You can leave a rating or review on Apple Podcast or Spotify, even if you don't listen on these platforms, a good rating allows the podcast to acquire some clout, which I'm told is good. And I'm also developing a bit of a long-term project, which is a email newsletter. So you can sign up for that on my website or in the show notes to the podcast. And the basic idea is for this to be a free, low-stress monthly to quarterly-ish email that offers historical perspective on modern-day issues, behind-the-scenes content on my latest podcast stuff, historical lessons and takeaways from the world of history, psychology, and philosophy. The point is for it to be only a couple times a year, always constructive, useful, and positive. So again, that's a bit of a long-term project that is hopefully going to launch sometime next year, but you can sign up for it now. Okay, with all that being said, what you're about to hear is a bonus episode from the Patreon feed. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you have a great holiday season, and as always, thanks for listening. In the 1980s, Scientists at the University of Chicago ran a maybe unethical experiment to determine what would happen if you prevented rats from dreaming. They set up a little rat treadmill, a hamster wheel, and they suspended it over water. When the rats were placed on the treadmill, eventually they were allowed to fall asleep. The rats were allowed to continue sleeping, but when the rats transitioned from the stage of deep sleep to the stage of REM sleep, REM sleep, which is the stage of sleep that dreams occur at, the scientists moved the treadmill and forced the rats to wake up. If they didn't, they would get thrown off and splashed in the water. So it wasn't sleep deprivation, it was dream deprivation. In his article, Enter the Supersensorium, neuroscientist Eric Howell describes what happened to the rats. He says, quote, After a few days, the rats began to lose weight. After a few weeks, they began to jaundice. Even their fur turned yellow, then their eyes. Their yellow paws developed lesions, and after a few weeks, every rat dropped dead from not dreaming. End quote. Aside from perhaps the interesting symbolism and metaphorical meaning of not being allowed to dream and the effects that might have on a person, or in this case, an animal. This study and studies like it bring up interesting questions about the nature of dreams. What purpose do they serve? Why do we dream? 
and what is happening physically in our brains when we do dream. And what does all this mean for us as humans? There's also the interesting question of what is the difference between being in a dream and being awake? This might seem like a bit of a silly question at first, but in his article, Enter the Supersensorium, neuroscientist Eric Howell seems to think that this is a question potentially worth asking in our modern society. He believes that 21st century technology and entertainment is not so different than being in a dream, and perhaps we need to be careful about how we navigate these waters. Talking about modern society, Howell says, quote, We find ourselves strolling the aisles of a vast sensorium. On the shelves is a trove of experiences, video games, movies, TV shows, virtual reality, books, and comics, all pre-packaged for our consumption. What had previously been accomplished for food through the distribution of supermarkets has now been done with experience itself. The recent grand opening of this super sensorium has been mediated through the screen, a panoply of icons, images, links, downloads, and videos autoplaying, which we browse through entirely at our leisure. End quote. Think about the average day for, honestly, myself and probably many people listening to this podcast right now. Wake up, check your phone, listen to music or maybe a podcast on your commute to work, stare at a screen at work for most of the day, perhaps checking emails, texting friends, playing games, watching YouTube videos looking at memes, maybe doing some work in there somewhere, commuting back home with more podcasts and music, maybe watch some TV, play some video games, check Twitter, post on social media, read a book, and go to bed. It seems like we are constantly plugged in. Our senses are being filled with information, a lot of it probably coming from some sort of screen or another. And whether it is books or YouTube videos or memes or television shows or even social media, there's usually a story being told. In some way or another, there's some sort of narrative, however vague, that is happening in the background of these things. And we seem to be attracted to these narratives. And the algorithms that produce them, the AI that controls this super sensorium, as Eric Howell calls it, is only going to become more powerful, more efficient, and the allure to enter this super sensorium will only get stronger as it learns and as the algorithms continue to grow. Think about how effective and efficient something like the YouTube algorithm that recommends videos to you has become, for good or for bad. As Eric Howell points out, inside of this super sensorium, there is art, and there's entertainment, and there's story, and there's narrative. But Howell makes a distinction between entertainment and art. In his view, entertainment is something that's usually just mere attention-grabbing. There's not a lot of depth to it. It's not helping us as people to develop. Whereas art elicits a reaction out of us. It delves into the personal and the societal and the ways that human beings interact and develop. For example, we could open up Netflix and we could watch a bunch of different things. But in this example, we could either watch The Fast and the Furious or we could watch Mad Men. Now, different people have different tastes, and there's different definitions of what makes something art versus entertainment, and we should absolutely leave room for that, but I think in general, most people would believe that something like Mad Men has a little bit more depth, there's a little bit more sophisticated themes, it's perhaps shining a mirror on your own life, and 
perhaps critiquing certain elements of society, whereas the Fast and Furious has fast cars racing and Vin Diesel beating people up. Not to say that there isn't narratives and themes and archetypes in something like The Fast and Furious that are interesting, but I think in general, Eric Hole is trying to say there is this distinction between mere entertainment and art. But either way, there seems to be this desire that human beings have for these stories and for these narratives and for the way that they fill up our senses. And the fact that it seems to pull at our human nature so deeply brings up a lot of interesting questions. Eric Hole says, quote, It's the scale of the supersensorium that makes it a problem of the modern age, pushing to the fore old questions about the purpose of fiction. Why do humans desire these petite narratives that we gobble up like treats? What's the origin of this pull toward artifice, a thing so powerful we might even call it an instinct? Is it virtue or vice? And if it can be a vice, and technology is making it easier and easier to while away our lives this way, a reasonable person has to ask, why add to the supersensorium? Why take away from the real when the real is already back on its heels and behind it a cliff? End quote. So is this supersensorium where we have instant access to these entertainment items, whether they're movies or TV shows or podcasts or music or social media, is this a bad thing for us and why does it seem to appeal to us so much? There's almost an addictive quality to it. Even if the stuff we're absorbing isn't necessarily even quote-unquote good, a lot of it is just mere entertainment. As Howell points out, a lot of this is very deep human psychology, and a lot of it goes back to the original stories, the original narratives, the first fiction, which in Howell's opinion is dreams. Every person that dreams is capable of creating fictions, capable of creating art, capable of thinking abstractly and creating narratives, even if those narratives don't make any sense. It's worth asking what dreams are. Howell says that in one sense at least, dreams are, quote, the locking of an awake brain in a sensory deprivation tank of flesh and bone. Without this paralysis, we would act out our dreams and our nightmares. For those with rare sleep disorders, muscle output isn't inhibited, and they often injure themselves as their fictions become reality. End quote. When we dream, our brains are awake, our consciousness is awake, but our body is locked, our body is sleeping. This, of course, brings up the interesting question of what makes being awake any more real than dreaming? Perhaps a question to ponder while watching The Matrix or maybe The Truman Show. But anyway, another question worth asking is why do we dream? The short answer is scientists aren't really sure, but the long answer is typically given as sleep and dreaming are a way for the body and the brain to sort of reset after a day of activity. Dreams are about memory consolidation, integrating memories together, rebuilding neural pathways and connections in the brain. And all of this stuff allows us to start a new day fresh after a night of dreaming. The only problem with this explanation is that it doesn't really tell us anything about dreaming itself. It doesn't tell us about the experience of dreaming and what it might do for us. At the level of subjective experience, this sort of physical definition is lacking. Eric Howell proposes a different purpose for dreaming that gets at this narrative aspect, this fictional aspect of dreams that connects with our passion and our love, seemingly, as humans, of fiction. Howell thinks that perhaps the purpose of dreaming is the dreams themselves. He says, quote, 
Dreams are like random walks of experiences, a form of exploration. To frame dreams this way makes it more obvious why they matter. Dreaming allows us to explore the experiential statescape in ways that deviate from waking life. And this is a good thing, even from a strictly evolutionary perspective. The utility of dreams is that they do exactly this. The purpose of dreams is the dreams themselves. End quote. It seems true that we all have this capacity to create fiction. We all have the capacity to dream and create narratives and stories. Usually they're not good, usually they don't make sense, but they are fictions nonetheless. It's possible, according to Hole, that we do this as a way to test experiences. Oftentimes when we dream, we dream of falling or failure or some sort of embarrassment. Perhaps, maybe that's just me. But maybe there's some sort of evolutionary practice value in doing something like this with our dreams. If we fail or if we fall in our dreams, maybe when those things happen in reality, we'll be a little bit more prepared, even if only subconsciously. Howell calls this avoiding overfitting, meaning that oftentimes dreams mess with categories, they're filled with nonsense, they have strange patterns that don't make any sense. Last night, I dreamed about a dog that could rotate its head 360 degrees. Uh, so that was weird. But Howell thinks that perhaps dreaming is about creating possibilities that simply don't exist in our boring, everyday life. Remember that day I described where we wake up and go to work and probably do the same thing four to five days a week? We're probably not going to see many dogs with rotating heads on our commutes. So perhaps by creating these possibilities that don't exist in the real world, the brain is able to get outside of these boring and routine patterns and somehow find ways to learn and develop new connections and new pathways from these fictions, from these narratives that don't really exist in the real world. In other words, dreaming is exercise for the brain. As Steve Carell famously says in The 40-Year-Old Virgin, use it or lose it. Eric Howell describes this idea saying, quote, Dreaming, then, isn't about integrating new memories or processing the day's events. It's rather a necessary technique for ensuring a healthy waking consciousness, one that can navigate possible experiences. And it's the banality and self-sameness of an animal's days that evolved the inner fabulist. Here originates our need for novelty and for some novels. End quote. For Eric Howell, the fact that dreams are based around fiction and narrative and story, and the fact that this super sensorium that he describes, this constant barrage of sensory input that is characteristic of modern life, the fact that that is also based in fiction and narrative and story isn't a coincidence. For Eric Howell, the backbone of the supersensorium is humans outsourcing their dreams to reality. He says, quote, Novels, movies, TV shows, it is easy for us to suspend our disbelief because we are biologically programmed to surrender it when we sleep. I don't think it's a coincidence that a TV show traditionally lasts about the same 30 minutes in length as the average REM sleep event. This hypothesized connection explains why humans find the directed dreams we call fictions so attractive and also reveals their purpose. They are artificial means of accomplishing the same thing naturally occurring dreams do. Just like dreams, fictions keep us from overfitting our model of the world. Since society specializes for efficiency and competency, we began to outsource the labor of the internal fabulist to an external one. Shamans, and then storytellers with their myths, and then poets, writers, directors, all external dream makers producing superior artificial dreams. 
result is that a human equipped with modern experiential technology, for example, TV and novels, can gain the benefits of dreams even during the day. End quote. Novelist George R. R. Martin once said that dreams are more real than real. And I think this idea is kind of what he meant. Author Yuval Noah Harari once said, quote, We can cooperate flexibly with countless numbers of strangers because we alone, of all the animals on the planet, can create and believe fictions, fictional stories. And as long as everybody believes in the same fictions, everybody obeys and follows the same rules, the same norms, the same values. End quote. Think about all the things that are central to our lives that are true, but some people might argue actually are fictions. Myths or narratives or archetypes that groups of humans together come together to believe and thus make them true. As examples in his article, Eric Howell points to things like the concept of money, the concept of nations, religions, the idea of a self. Each of these, and the extent to which they're true with a capital T or fiction with a capital F, can certainly be debated. But for Howell, the point is that this concept of narratives and stories is serving a purpose that is deep and fundamentally human. He says, quote, The better we understand narratives, the better our ability to coordinate the fragments of ourselves that have been scattered across time. Artificial fictions serve as a set of examples, and they also allow us to randomly walk about different selves, exercising the experiential space that pertains to the governance and understanding of selves, in much the same manner that dreams do for perceptions, actions, and categories in general. In the end, our artificial dreams are similar enough to natural ones, but the emphasis on selfhood and personal journeys indicates their constructed nature, their purposiveness. They avoid overfitting while also instructing, however subtly. The world is like this. A person is like this. A family is like this. Over and over again until we get, slowly, a model of the world and a model of ourselves generalized enough to match the fluidity of the world, end quote. That's a bit dense there, but George R.R. R. Martin once said, the man who reads lives a thousand lives. The idea is that these narratives, these fictions, these stories, these archetypes are allowing us to exercise our brain, allowing us to put ourselves in other people's shoes allowing us to experience something different than getting up when the alarm goes off every morning and driving to work in traffic. And not only is this something that humans enjoy, it's something that they need. It's built into their evolutionary biology. It's the same function that dreams serve. I think Eric Hole would argue that, mechanically speaking, what is the difference between dreaming and watching a movie or reading a good book or listening to a story? What is actually different between those two activities other than the sense that you are awake? Eric Hole thinks that this desire to create artificial dreams is so innate and so powerful in humans that it's a super stimulus. In nature, a super stimulus is something that gets an animal so excited to do something that it seemingly just forgets that anything else exists in the entire world. Howell says, quote, In biology, this is called a super stimulus. It's like a hack for behavioral reward. Baby goals cry and peck at their mother's mouth, which is striped in red. Lower a painted stick with stripes of the reddest red, and they'll climb out of the nest in excitement. Australian beetles are so attracted to the brown backs of discarded beer bottles that they bake to death in the hot desert sun, mating with them. End quote. And just like animals or insects, humans are vulnerable to these super stimuli as well. 
And at times, we're at their mercy, even if we don't realize it. Food, sex, instant gratification. And I think Howell might argue perhaps dreams and these artificial dreams and narratives as well. It's tough not to argue that social media has become a super stimulus. Howell says, quote, Social media is frictionless, instant, enveloping. As a super stimulus, it exacerbates the natural social relations of primates. There, we are often reduced to our most basic instincts of aggression, othering, and gossip mongering. All this while receiving a serotonin hit impossible to maintain in face to face socialization due to its scale, anonymity, and ease of access. End quote. And all this while, people have barely noticed. Because it's largely anonymous and because it's face-to-face, we can't always see the absolute carnage that social media might be wreaking on society. Howell says, quote, Imagine if we could see the aftermath of social media attack as clearly as we see that of physical attack. There goes the Upper East Side mom jogging with her baby carriage, blood staining her mouth, teeth, hands. There goes the thin-shouldered, unintimidating gamer, his shirt a mess of gore. It would surprise you who the truly vicious in society are. End quote. So if social media is a potential super stimulus that is incredibly powerful, as we know, and incredibly dangerous, as we know, then we should be prepared for the super sensorium to be the same way. Entering into this world of constant stimulation and constant narrative, constant story bombarding us day after day, hour after hour, literally, for many people, second after second. And it's capitalizing on the things that make us human. It's addictive to be the protagonist in your own story the center of all creation, the hero of ages that is the origin of all causation. But if 7 billion other people believe the same thing, then we have a huge problem. And it gets a lot worse if everything we are absorbing in this super sensorium is just empty calories, just mere entertainment that takes advantage and appeals to our base default human instinct mode, the internal addict that fiends on rage and jealousy and control and gossip and hate. Eric Hohl argues that this is why we need to maintain the importance of art and not just mere entertainment. He says, quote, Entertainment means to maintain, to keep someone in a certain frame of mind. Art, however, changes us. Who hasn't felt what the French call for song at the reading of a book or the watching of a movie? William James called it the same oceanic feeling produced by religion. While the empty calories of entertainment fill our senses, art expands us, which is why art is so often accompanied by the feeling of transcendence, of the sublime. We all know the feeling. It is the warping of the foundations of our experience as we are internally rearranged by the hand of the artist, as if they have reached inside our heads, elbow deep, and on, finding that knot at the center of all brains, yanked us into some new, unexplored part of our consciousness. End quote. In Howell's mind, we need to hold on to real art, not just entertainment. Real art, gives and it takes, something we can form a personal relationship with and a societal bond with. Because it turns out the Matrix got it wrong. It's not 7 billion people hooked up to one Matrix. It's 7 billion people hooked up to 7 billion different simulations. Everyone has their own story that they're addicted to and that they're the star of. And if we're all hooked up to this matrix, if we're all hooked up to this super sensorium, 
Our default mode is to be asleep without dreaming. Mere entertainment. Not pushing any boundaries or helping us grow. Merely absorbing stuff. Stuff that appeals to our base instincts as animals. So if we are going to be hooked up to this super sensorium, wouldn't it be better to keep art alive? To keep real stories alive? To keep dreams alive?